Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar this afternoon. I'm Kate, Head of Development at Botcher England and along with the rest of the development team we'll provide you with an update on our work to change lives through Botcher. We've set aside one and a half hours which includes around 20 minutes at the end to answer some questions following the update. Just a couple of practical things to help you get uh, help you out before we get started. We've muted all our microphones just to limit background noise, but we do welcome any questions from anyone listening today. Please use the chat function on your screen to let us know if you're having any problems viewing the webinar and we will try and help. Or you can use that to raise a question for us to answer at the end. We've got Danielle here with us today to coordinate the questions. Please also bear with us, there is a slight delay with the technology because we're all remote ourselves trying to um, switch screens and things, so if you just bear with us. But we hope you're comfortable and have refreshments, and although the video will be turned off for the duration of the webinar, the team will now just turn our cameras on to be able to say hi and introduce ourselves. Hello, I'm Kate, Head of Development. Hi, I'm George, Development Officer of Ultraplan Safeguarding. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm Dan, uh, Development Officer for Schools. And I'm Sarah, Competition Manager. So we're going to turn our videos off, but we'll turn them on at the end again to answer any questions. Sorry. The webinar will be recorded and available in the next couple of days, so you'll be able to listen to it again and in your own time or if your signal drops out. We're pleased that 32 people are registered for this webinar and it gives us a range of people from players, volunteers and partner organisations joining us. So welcome to you all. If you joined us at the first advisory group meeting last September, you will have seen this slide. I think it's useful to share it as we've recently welcomed George and Sarah to the team and to highlight our structure for those that are not aware of it. We're a small team of 10 and four of who are part time. You can see on the slide, the development team is on the left of the screen and Botch England also has our talent, talent development manager, Sandra, our fundraising manager, Callie, our business support manager, Emma, Team Administrator Danielle, who's with us today, and finally, CEO Chris. In normal circumstances, we would all mainly be working from our office in Nottingham, busy delivering a, a botcher competition season at the moment. However, in these uncertain and unusual times, we're all now working from home. Before I get into the information that we had originally planned to cover today, it's important to update you on our work in light of the coronavirus situation. We hope you and your families are safe and well. It's a challenging time and our priority was and does remain the well-being of our players, members, volunteers and staff. Although all Botcher activity was cancelled, the staff team, team has adapted well and you will hear about the impact and what we're doing to help keep people active at home through Botcher. For now, our club activity, competitions and courses continue to be suspended. We will continue to review the situation and make plans for the return of Botcher only when it is safe to do so. Our website will publish any changes to our guidance. In the meantime, we have increased our activity on social media around the two hashtags on the screen, Botcher at Home and Active at Home. And we have shared activities and adapted activities to do at home and just this week launched a virtual way to play for fun, and Sarah will tell you more later. Within the sector, we are being well supported by our main funder, Sport England, and their campaign called Join the Movement is spreading the message about innovative ways people are being active at home. We'd much rather be on the botcher courts with you, but in this current situation, we're lucky to have such an adaptive and inclusive sport that many are playing at home now. This is the social media calendar. It shows you some of the activity across the week. And um, it's been great to see some of you at the Tea Break Tuesday. 
and hope you've been enjoying all the other content as well. So that's just there for you to see what we're doing. Over the next few slides, I just wanted to provide um, a bit of context to the development team and our work before I hand you over to team members to talk in more detail on their specific work areas. The development team wants to make the experience a good one for players so more people stay engaged and new people want to join. Our broad areas are supporting and developing clubs, supporting and developing our workforce to deliver activity, delivering and developing our competitions, and developing and delivering programmes for schools and through partners. It's important we improve our understanding of the people playing and involved in Botcher to help provide a quality experience that encourages people to continue playing. We don't want to work in isolation and this advisory group provides one of the ways for us sharing our work and hearing about what is happening at a local level. As an organisation that is clear that Botcher changes lives, it's important that we can find ways to demonstrate its impact and communicate it to others. And we started to do that and we'll go into a bit more of that later. In terms of how Botcher England is funded, Sport England is our main funder and we have just entered our final year of a four year cycle. We also receive funding from elsewhere through grants and trusts and for example, um, from Children in Need and the Masonic Foundation for specific programmes. We are required to report back to funders on what we have done and sometimes the challenge can be matching up the funders requirements and ours. But luckily what we're tasked to do does fit nicely with what we want to do, which is using our sport to change people's lives. Just to talk briefly around um, the key audience that we work with, there are three that we sort of focus uh, our development work on and they are our regular players and they are people that are playing a number of times a month that come from club environments or might be taking part on a regular basis through taking part in competitions. Then there's the group that are playing within educational settings. At the moment for us, it's mainly through schools, although we have started to do some work within colleges and um, some talent work around universities. And then the third area is around tackling inactivity. And this is where we are working with partners who look to engage older people and disabled people who are currently not deemed to be active, which is less than 30 minutes activity a week. And I'll talk about these audiences a little bit more later as well. So we established the advisory group last year to work more closely with people who wanted to help us to change lives through Botcher. A copy of the terms of reference for the group is on our website, along with information about our first meeting. But we wanted to make it an open group that people can join and take part in the, the two meetings a year every time or drop in on different meetings just to find out about what we're doing. At our first face to face meetings uh, last year, 15 people attended and we had some really good discussions that took place. This six monthly update was always planned to be a virtual one to enable more people to find out about what we were doing. And the face to face meeting is the opportunity to discuss more of those topics in more detail and hearing a bit less from us. Given the situation, and it's likely we're still going to be in this sort of situation in September, um, we're going to have to consider how we do that virtually uh, so we can build on the information from today. But hopefully there will be more um, interactive sort of sessions next time. The first meetings introduced the key areas of development, which we will provide you an update with on today. So since, since September, we have progressed uh, a number of key areas. As a small organisation, we work with partners. Um, our work with partners is really crucial in helping us to reach more people and to raise awareness of our sport. But the work we've done with partners has given us a clearer picture on the number of people playing Botcher and the impact it has had on them. We also work with a range of partners on a specific programme that tackles inactivity amongst older people and disabled people called Be Together. We have a limited amount of resource from Sport England to undertake that programme and it has been effective in working with partners to provide guidance, training and equipment to engage their audiences in Botcher. In relation to demonstrating the impact that Botcher has on people's lives, the skills award that Dan will talk through has given us real evidence of how Botcher can improve life skills such as communication and resilience of young disabled people. The current government strategy, A Sporting Future, looks to use sport for social good and the skills award has enabled us to demonstrate individual development through Botcher 
which has been massively beneficial to us as a charity. The programme is also really well received by schools and teachers and the pupils and it has provided us with some super quotes from the young people taking part too, so we know they really enjoy it. The establishment of our 14 club forums, which George will provide more information on, the advisory group today and our competition review which we undertook last year has all helped improve what we know about the people in our sport and what they need from us to make their experience better. For example, the competition review told us loud and clear that people want more opportunities to play, which is a key part of the resulting competition plan that's now in place. We also carried out our first Big Botcher survey last year, which has given us great information, and I'll provide more information on the next slide about this. We've continued to deliver the sport, until March anyway, in the traditional way that we know, um, and we're missing seeing all the players, volunteers and supporters we would usually be seeing a lot of at our competitions and we look forward to seeing you all on the courts in the future. The volunteers give up so much for, of their time to allow our sport to happen and we know you're missing it too. We're really pleased that over the last few months we've been recognised on two occasions for our work to develop botcher in schools, which has helped to raise our profile across the sector. There have been challenges and there's always more to do but we want to make the sport as great as we can for our players so we continue to develop it. So I mentioned the Big Botcher survey on the previous slide. On the left are highlights from the findings of that survey. Uh, and it was for the first time we, that we collected information on all players, so members and non-members. It was a long survey, um, but it has given us a lot of data and we will be looking to repeat it again this year and it will become an annual survey that we can track different things around the measurements of it. So it is really useful to us. So from that survey, some of the highlights, 52% uh, of play, players, uh, for them, botcher is the only sport or activity they do, which makes it so important for us to develop. And the sport has a positive impact on 88% of players' daily lives. This is really important for us to know and measure uh, and to have available when we are making the case for funding and for our own understanding of the importance of the sport for those engaged. There's also some other information that we've, we've been able to get hold of over the last few months. We now know that over 54,000 people played botcher over the last year and this is from April last year to March this year. The next slide, which I'll click on now, shows what this 54,000 is made up of. So in terms of how it compares, at the meetings last September, we knew of just over 40, 49,000 people that have played botcha. It's not just down to a surge in people playing over the last few months, but our ability to understand how to access information about who is playing and where, and we're capturing that better. So of, the, of that figure, we know eight, over 8,000 are regular players that we term as regular players, and these are either members um, or numbers that are coming through partners, that, that regular people that are playing and they're people that are playing within clubs and competitions. We have um, 25,000 just over within education. So this is mainly through the School Games programme, which is a national programme and our Skills Award programme. We have over 21,000 that are playing as we term inactive people that we're working with, partners there and um, that's our partnership work, which I've talked about. But as you can see, a very small amount, 732 are affiliated members, but that's included in the, the regular players. We also know that there are more people beyond this playing. This is only the data that we capture, but we are getting an ever improving picture of just how many people play and the scale of the sport is a lot bigger than what we believed it was three years ago. Many sports get data from the national survey called Active Lives, and although the numbers for botcher are too small to feature. It does give us a good indication on the activity levels of people across England. The latest results were recently published and showed activity levels in the 12 months from November 2018 to November 2019. It shows that before the coronavirus outbreak, the highest, it was the highest activity levels ever recorded, with more people therefore experienced the benefits of taking part in sport. The report also shows a continued growth in the number of people, uh, disabled people regularly taking part, which is hugely encouraging. 
Unfortunately, coronavirus will have an impact on all sports, and particularly ours, and we need to try to continue to maintain our link with the people in our sport so they can come back looking forward to play once it's safe to do so. So hopefully that's a, a useful brief overview from me of our work. What will happen now is we'll take it in turns to hand over to team members to give you an update on their areas. And to start with, I'm going to be handing over to George to talk to you about supporting and developing clubs. Oops, sorry, George. Thank you, Kate, and good afternoon, everybody. Over the next 10 minutes, I'll be providing a quick update on how Partial Union are supporting and developing our club around the country. Firstly, <laughs> Shall I buy that? Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is George Byron. As ha and as Kate mentioned earlier, I started working at Watson England in December 2019 as development officer for Clubs and Safeguarding, having been retired at the Vintage Line for, for four years. Um, firstly, a quick update on our club network. And as you can see on the screen, we currently have 64 member clubs all across England who are competing. Here, here are our members and are and are competing in our, our competition. Earlier this year in January, what is the England North Star brand new refresh and revamp what is a boost accreditation scheme? This scheme recognises and rewards good practices of clubs and groups that is delivered on a regular basis to both disabled and non-disabled people. So how does this zero on the to the previous accreditation scheme we have had? It now has three levels. It now has three levels, bronze, silver, and gold, while we understood the two before. And now any school organisation or charity that the box can apply for accreditation, regardless of whether they are a member of Box England or not. And if it and the and the best part of this that it's free to apply for and it, and it lasts for three years. Since launching the scheme, we have been so pleased with how it has been received. Across England, we currently have 19 accredited clubs, 4 golds, 8 silver, and 7 bonds. And we are erasing evidence from the six organisations. It's been great to hear such positive feedback from the clubs about the scheme, including from Bob Duff. Duffery at Reach Manfield, he gave his the credit that he carried on the, on the screen. At Watering and Agile committed to continuous improvement 
I feel it's a real, real big conduct thing. A real, a real, a scheme, scheme in order to make sure you can find in it as much as possible. Therefore, any feedback, positive or, or negative, that they have about the scheme would be more than welcome to help us to support, to support us with this. Moving on to box of forum, which were established our short term. These are a network of clubs, schools and organisations which come together to support the growth of box in their areas. As you can see on the map, there are currently 14 box of forums which are now being established all across England. And since last August, eight, eight of these forums have held have, have, have meetings. A, a few more meetings had been arranged, unfortunately, due to coronavirus, these have had, had, had to be cancelled. If you are interested in joining a forum or setting one up in our area, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Some of you may have already seen or had heard about our new box of bridge resources. These are 20 resources which will be launching throughout the year to support clubs to start up, grow and manage these activities. I'm, I'm pleased to let you know that and the first five resources are now live on the website to download and that the next four will be released very soon. And finally, safeguarding. But the England remains committed to creating and maintaining a safe and positive environment for everybody to participate in Butler. This is why we are currently carrying out a club, club safeguarding order to identify which clubs have, have club welfare officers and, and which, and, and then the and then the training that they may need. Every every year, Bart and Inga meet the NSPCC TPSC standards on an annual basis. We have also set up a new safeguarding email address for for any safeguarding content to be sent to. This email address is safeguarding at Bart and Dot all dot UK. So, what, what do the next six months look like for me? Firstly, I will be working on increasing the number of accredited parts of groups we have around the country, as well as increasing the number of parts of forums we have around the country to have a larger, so we have a larger area of the country covered, covered by these. I'll continue to de develop and design our box of beach resources to support club. And, these, and like I said before, these will be rolled out throughout the year. I'm also looking at establishing a national online support network for box of forums and clubs around the country. This will probably be an online platform via Facebook. So what out for this in the coming months. The, the annual box I'll be working on the annual box award. It will take place take place for it to the end of the year and we'll keep up to the with that. And finally in we have National Box Day twenty twenty coming up. Which this year will be held on and the 27th of September, and I can reveal today that the, the, the theme on this year's uh, not about today will be back back to clubs, providing that uh, we are in a good situation for clubs to return. We, we need you all to get involved with this, and we will be saying more details over the summer. Thank you for listening, and I look Look forward to working 
Men för honom, det är även det kan min man som det är så här. Alla är det för att det är någonting. Han är kvällen att det är med här. Alla är någon presentation. Han är någon passar för till mig. Han är en app som är så att det är en app där. Han är en app för oss. Hi everyone. Um, so we had a little request from Raf, I think, in the chat just to turn our videos on for our sections just to help you to follow it. So we will give that a little try and see how it works. Um, so thanks, George. Um, I'm Natalie, as I said, and I'm going to talk you through all things linked to workforce now. So just as a reminder of what workforce development is all about, my aim um, is to oversee the recruitment, development, deployment and retention of the Botcher workforce. And for us, that includes our officials, our coaches, our classifiers, our tutors and all other club and general volunteers. And we know that all these people work very hard um, within club, academy, competition and all other local settings. So this next slide gives us a bit of a snapshot of some of those roles I just mentioned. Um, all of these people are key in delivering the sport and this gives us a feel for the size of our workforce. Obviously, we are always striving to increase these numbers um, just to give us a stronger infrastructure to support the sport. Next up, some of you may remember that last August, we invited volunteers to complete an online survey. And this is the first time we've surveyed all um, volunteers in one go. And it is our aim to continue to improve insight in this area. So hopefully, as you might be able to see from this infographic on the screen, there's lots of positive things that we can take away from the results. So figures like the fact that 50% of respondents have been volunteering for at least six years and also 90% of people plan to volunteer the same amount or more going forward. So that really showcases for us what a dedicated and committed workforce we have. And with future surveys, we hope to increase the response rate because this still was quite a small sample. Um, and we also want to explore better ways to capture the activity and opinions of our club volunteers in particular. So whilst we're obviously very disappointed that the current botcher season has concluded a little bit earlier than expected, there's still plenty for us to shout about in terms of what our workforce have contributed between September and March. So across our competitions, we've had over 100 unique volunteers supporting the nine events that we delivered. And we, we've estimated that we think that equates to about two and a half thousand volunteer hours. 
We've also delivered 45 training courses to include uh, leaders workshops, coaching and officiating awards. And in total, this gave us about 275 hours of training delivered to 500 delegates. And then across our 25 academy days, supported by a team of 20 coaches, we've delivered, again, a considerable number of coaching hours to players. And whilst we're obviously really pleased with these statistics, it doesn't even touch on the endless number of hours that volunteers within our club networks also give to the sport. So talking briefly about coronavirus now, um, in terms of courses and training, we are reviewing the time frame regularly, but at the, at the current time, all our courses, workshops and courses up until the end of June at least have been postponed. Um, we, we're hoping that we can reschedule everything we've cancelled up, up to now, but again, the timescales around this um, are currently unknown and I'm sure you can appreciate we're not taking any bookings at the current time. So we've obviously been trying to maintain engagement with the volunteers and we recently asked people what they've been up to in replace of Botcher whilst they can't uh, volunteer for us in the traditional way and it was really lovely to hear some of the activities that people have been doing in their free time and showing that they are busy and safe. And likewise, we also asked them specifically what they've been missing about Botcher. And these were some of the really heartwarming responses that we had through. And hopefully that means that our volunteer workforce will be very enthusiastic to return to support us as and when that's possible. And in the meantime, we've generally been engaging with volunteers, uh, mainly uh, through work, uh, through social media, as you'd expect. And um, we've been sharing uh, coaching video content online and some fun activities like bingos and quizzes. So looking forward a little bit now, behind the scenes, we've been working on uh, a new version of the Botcher Leaders Award. So this replaces uh, the old Leaders Award, the old young officials and the young leaders. So we'll now have one single course that acts as an introduction to the sport before individuals go on to progress on a more specific coaching or officiating pathway if they choose to. So the new course will be three hours in length and will be suitable for anyone aged 12 years and above. We've already recruited some new tutors and we've partially trained some of this workforce along with upskilling our existing tutors. The costs for external organisations to host and deliver the new course will be £320 plus tutor expenses. And whilst we don't have a formal launch date as yet, we're, we're just in the background finalising the last parts of the course and hope to be able to offer this new course for booking and delivery as and when the relevant restrictions lift. So also in terms of planning for the future, over the summer we'll hopefully be able to start looking at dates and locations of our level one officiating and level one coaching courses for next season. So each year um, within Botcher England we host about four each of these courses and we carefully consider their location based on demand and activity within a particular area. So if you are part of a club or an organisation where you think you've got demand specifically for one of these courses, please do get in touch with me. We also sometimes have internal funding to support individuals through the qualifications. Um, but otherwise, as you can see on the slide, that gives you a bit of a feel for the, the format and the price and structure. We also want to make a start on developing a new volunteers handbook, which will hopefully act is a useful resource for both new and existing volunteers. So this is in, in the very early stages at the moment, so we'll be consulting more to find out what people want from this resource. Um, so again, feel free to contact me if you've got any thoughts on that area. 
And finally, in the short term, we'll be celebrating Volunteers Week at the start of June. So keep your eye on social media because we'll be sharing lots of good news stories about all the great things that our volunteers do for the sport. And likewise, if you are from a club or a local setting where you work with your own volunteers, we'd encourage you to use this opportunity to say thanks to them and get, a lot, get involved in the campaign alongside us as well. So that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. And I'll now pass you over to Dan. Hello. Um, so I'll just be talking through um, what's been happening in the school section um, over the last six months and where we're, we're hoping to take it um, over the coming um, months and ultimately over the coming, coming years as well. Um, so like Kate mentioned at the beginning, oops, sorry, There we go. Like Kate mentioned at the beginning, a significant number of our participants um, take part through um, schools um, and education, and that could be through the, the Skills Award, through the Butcher England Schools competition, through the school games, um, and through the emerging developments that we're um, working with colleges, um, which has only really started this year. Again, as Kate mentioned, this year we've been um, nominated for two awards um, for the work that we're doing in schools. We were fortunate to win the National Governing Body of the Year Award at the School Games Summit back in November. Um, and this was voted for by the School Games Network. So different organisers, the other National Governing Body staff, um, trust staff. Um, we were also finalists for the Sport and Recreation Alliance Community Sport Award for Youth Development back in March, where we narrowly missed out, but it was um, another recognition for the work that we're doing within, within schools. So, who do we work with? Um, we work with the Youth Sport Trust, um, as I've just mentioned through the school games, um, and their school games network. We also work through um, their development team on the development of the resources for the Skills Award, for the existing Skills Award, and you'll soon see the, the new plans we have for a, a new award coming through. And then the insight and research team, just to help support um, providing more evidence around the figures that we've got, so um, they can help support quantifying where, what these figures mean mean for us. We also work with the um, Botchling School Games or Schools competition organisers. Um, this varies in um, different areas as to how much support they, they require um, and we, we work with different organisers in slightly different ways to try and um, grow and develop areas um, for more people to take part. Um, and finally, like I said, with the developing work with colleges, we're starting to work with the Association of Colleges as well. So the impact of COVID-19, um, as Kate and Natalie and George have uh, mentioned, we all, we all want to ideally be on a botcher court playing botcher somewhere somewhere with um, our friends, family, um, or peers from school. Um, although there's no formal botch delivery now through schools, we know that schools are open for the key worker children and for vulnerable children. So we're trying as, as much as possible to support those schools with activities, games, resources, to continue providing opportunities to play botch for those school students they have in school. Um, this could be through um, the resource you can see there on the screen, which is a, a school games resource card, as well as the adapt adapted activity cards that Kate mentioned earlier. The impact of the current situation on, um, on the programmes for next year 
as you can understand, is quite unclear. Uh, we're unsure as to when we're going to be able to start um, delivering competitions and delivering um, sessions again. Um, but we are still planning for next next year, um, as well as considering alternative competition formats and um, activity formats to accommodate any measures that are put in place by the government once the um, isolating um, measures are lifted. So looking at the Skills Award, um, to start with, this is one of the um, programmes that we deliver through secondary schools um, and start through, through colleges. For those of you that don't know the Skills Award, it's a three year programme for students aged 12 to 18, and it's to develop key life skills over a 10 week programme. The life skills are communication, innovation, responsibility, resilience and evaluation. Over the last three years, we've seen over now 370 young people take part in the, the Skills Award through, um, no, in fact, sorry. We've seen over um, 900 young people take part in the um, Skills Award over the three years. Um, and this year we've seen 300, over 350 take part across 54 schools and colleges. Moving forward with the Skills Award over the next six months, um, we've applied to Children in Need for some continuation funding for the programme. Um, still waiting to hear back from them as to whether we've been successful. Um, if we are successful, in the first year of the award, we'll continue with the current programme, so delivering through secondary schools um, and colleges in that age group of 12 to 18, whilst also working with the Youth Board Trust to develop um, a resource for primary schools, which then through year two and three of the um, funding, we would then have the focus on the primary delivery, but we would still have secondary delivery um, available for people to take part as well. The Butcher England Schools competition, um, so since November, uh, sorry, September, we've worked with the organisers to ensure the competitions are scheduled um, and run until March when, the, um, when we put a halt to all Butcher activity. Um, through the work with those um, organisers, we've looked to increase participation. Um, an example of this is where we've introduced a competition in Greater Manchester, and we've also explored other opportunities and other options with different organisers in different areas across the country. Um, we've also worked with um, allowing more teams to qualify for their regional finals, should there be capacity at those competitions, to, to allow more um, individuals to see the standard um, at the next level so they are prepared for when they get there, um, hopefully in future years, that they're um, ready to compete at the next level. So planning over the next six months, um, like I say, we're not sure um, what the competition is going to be looking like. Um, we are considering alternative formats um, and we're still in the early stages of sort of looking at different alternatives to deliver over the, the next year, should they be needed. Um, we'll also continue to work with the county and regional, regional organisers uh, to set up the competitions and to deliver their competitions um, and then also identify any support that they might need if there's any um, significant changes over the, um, over the next year in terms of what the competition is going to look like. For those of you from the first um, advisory group meeting, you know that I like numbers and statistics. Um, so I'm just going to explain how the competitions have grown over the last six months through a few of the, the statistics we've gathered. So this year we've seen a 1% increase in the number of participants at counting county competitions compared to the same competitions last year. Um, we've also seen um, a 37% increase in the number of teams taking part in competitions. So Although there's a quite um, a big difference in those numbers, what we've seen is that 
although there's been more teams, it may have been the addition of one or two students within a school that has allowed them to have um, an additional team uh, enter for, for this year's competition, um, which is a great, great um, format for um, more people to take part in. And onto the school game. So um, for those of you that are unaware of the school games and what that is, and how that fits into our program, the school games um, is a, a network of school games organisers and local organising committees um, delivering a national program through the Youth Sport Trust and have been since 2010. Um, this is ranging from intra and inter-school activities through to um, county and regional national, uh, county, regional, national finals um, supported by the different national governing bodies. Um, delivery varies um, from different areas. So you may not see the traditional botcher activity um, at some of these events, um, but it's an introduction to the sport which may lead to people taking part more down the line. Again, you can see from the figures on the screen um, that this competition has continued to grow as well. Um, we've seen a 16% increase in the number of competitions from autumn last year to autumn this year, a 13% increase in participation, um, and a 13% increase in the number of teams that have taken part um, this year as well. Moving forward with the school games, we're going to look to support the exit route clubs um, that the school games have identified to see um, what botcher experience they've got um, and if there's anything that they need further support from us. Um, support Youth Sport Trust through the development of resources and activity cards for the future seasons and also um, as you saw with the resource card earlier on anything that comes up during this current um, period of lockdown that we can support promoting botcher activity to their network as well. Um, and then finally, to support the school games organisers with any botcher questions um, they may have to benefit the young people taking part in their activity. So that's all of the schools area um, from me. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to pop them into the um, chat section um, or ask them at the end. Um, I'm now going to pass on to Sarah um, to take you through um, the competitions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, so, uh, as, uh, as we said in the introduction, my name is uh, Sarah Wooding and I joined Botcher England on the 6th of January to cover Rachel Crack's uh, maternity leave as competition manager. I'm just going to get to the right place for the presentation hopefully. There we go. Okay, so for my first slide, I just want to talk to you, as others have, about the coronavirus and COVID-19 impact on the 2019-2020 competition season. So as most of you know, uh, the competition season was postponed on the 13th of March, and that initially just covered competitions scheduled for March and April. But the decision was taken the following week uh, to cancel the remainder of the season and that decision was communicated on the 19th of March. So from that decision uh, we formulated a variety of FAQ documents to hopefully answer questions that players, coaches and anyone involved in Botcher would have regarding the cancellation of the season and those documents were published onto the website and are reviewed regularly and so we will continue to do so while we're in this uh, situation. Uh, it is likely that uh, coronavirus will also have an impact on the 2020-21 competition season but I will cover that a bit in a bit more detail as we go on with the presentation. So just a, a review of the 2019 and 2020 competition season. As we said, uh, obviously the season would still be going if we were in a normal situation, but I'm just going to give you a review of how far we got. So uh, we, would, uh, we played two out of the three B Cup qualifying competitions. 
uh, we are still hoping to play a B Cup finals, a one day B Cup finals in October, but that is obviously subject to the current situation. And the reason for that view is that uh, playing or not playing the B Cup finals does have an impact on player rankings and also qualification into the UK Championships. So this is something that we're reviewing and we'll communicate further once the decision has been made. And regarding the Heathcote Cup, uh, we completed four of the six scheduled qualifying competitions and the finals were cancelled as not everybody had had the opportunity to play in the Heathcote Cup qualifier. Hello, sorry about this. We seem to have a, a problem with the technology. We're just going to see if we can try and get Sarah back and hopefully she'll be back with us soon and we can finish the update around competitions for you.
Okay, right. So I'm using computer audio. Um, okay. Sorry, everybody. I'm back now. <laughs> I don't quite know what happened there, but um, I'm reliably informed that uh, I was merrily talking about the next part of the slide and uh, that you were still on the uh, on the Heathcote Cup element. So, um, okay. So I, I had said that uh, National League. Some clubs had managed to play some of their matches. Some had played all of their fixtures, but the huge majority of clubs actually um, hadn't started their league matches so uh, the league has been cancelled for the year teams have been given the opportunity to transfer their entry fees to next competition season and uh, thank you very much I can see the messages coming in and uh, and so obviously those divisions uh, will could possibly change uh, with new participants entering the league and uh, teams returning so with Super League, uh, we completed two of the three days that were scheduled and the finals were cancelled, but we won't be promoting or relegating teams between the Super League divisions or down to National League for next season. So those divisions are likely to remain the same for uh, next year. OK, so and then um, I can't actually um, change my slides now. It's all going very well, so um, I just need to get access back to the screen to change the next slide yeah, so i will yeah. make the slides on for you if you like i'll take control back and then you can say thank you. thank you very much so can i have the next slide now please then kate <laughs> my assistant uh, there you go lovely thank you very much so this one is 2020-21 competition season planning so uh, Rachel had done um, obviously the majority of the planning for the 2019-20 season and had also started planning for 2020-21 uh, before I started and before her maternity leave began and I've continued the process. So um, but after the changes made following the competition review, there are no major changes planned to the calendar or types of competitions for 2020-21, especially as we only completed half of the 2019-20 season. So we don't have enough feedback or reason to make any changes. But that is apart from tweaking formats and schedule to address player and workforce welfare concerns. But as you'll see from the slide, planning is underway for BE Cup. Heathcote Cup, National League and Super League, and also a teams and pairs event. But the challenge at the moment, or challenges at the moment, are that many venues have bookings that were cancelled, like ours, alongside existing bookings for later this year and into next, so availability is limited. Also, many of the venue staff have been furloughed, so although we have provisional bookings with them, they're unable to confirm them at this stage. And then linked to that as well, uh, many of our venues that we use for competitions are university based and the universities are reluctant or unable to confirm dates until they know how the university terms will be affected. So again, it's all a bit of a movable feast at the moment, but we do have the basis of a calendar for next year. <laughs> Alongside that, I will also be reviewing the rules and regulations of the competitions, as Rachel would have done at the conclusion of the season, and that's to make any necessary changes or clarifications and to standardise where necessary. <clears throat> we'll also be undertaking a survey, but that will be at the end of the 2020-21 season, so just to give you a bit of advance warning of that one. And also uh, within the work for planning for the next competition season, I'll be doing my best to avoid clashes with other competitions where possible. But I think that with the backlog of competitions and other factors such as uh, restricted venue availability, it is, there is a likelihood that there could be some clashes. Also, I need to be mindful of other events in the calendar. So um, key dates like the UK Championships, which are still scheduled for the beginning of December this year, and also as the Paralympics has been postponed for 12 months, that also has an effect on Botch UK and BPA um, plans and also our athletes. So, Kate, can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Thank you very much. So you'll see at the top of this slide uh, that the first competition that is planned is 31st of October uh, 2020 um, for Warwick University. Now that's the one day B Cup finals for the 2019-20 season that I mentioned earlier. Warwick University was one of the venues that we should have been using in April, so we are keen to use them if we can at all possible. Uh, but you'll see as well um, that we're planning three B Cup qualifiers for next season at the same three venues that we use this year, which are Sheffield, Hatfield and Woodview's Gloucester, and with the final scheduled for Sheffield in May. 
Uh, there's a slight change to the Heathcote Cup competition in that uh, for next year we're planning five qualifying events and that compares with the six that we had planned for this season. But that decision was made before the coronavirus situation so that didn't have an effect on that decision at all. And the finals are scheduled for the end of April in Gloucester. And you'll see as well that uh, National League and Super League finals and a teams and pairs event is also scheduled um, in June and July at Nottingham University. So those dates are all either or at the moment and I'm awaiting confirmation from the University of Nottingham. And again, a lot of the factors I, I mentioned earlier will tie into that, uh, that schedule as to whether they can offer us the facilities that we need on the dates we want them. Kate, can I have my next slide, please? <clears throat> Thank you. So just now I want to talk to you about uh, competition management software. Um, to give you a bit of background, Botcher England invested in a bespoke competition management system in 2013, and that linked directly into our member management system. That and it was a huge step forward at the time, and it put us ahead in the world of disability sport and also Botcher. But however, when the new website was introduced in uh, 2019, we lost the competition management functionality and we've been operating with a manual system ever since. So currently all elements of the competition are manual. So that includes the draws for the pool stages, the scheduling, and then the calculations of the competition for progression from pool stages to the elimination rounds in accordance with the BISFED regulations. The whole process is very time consuming. It's not quick and that's not ideal at a competition where players and the officials are waiting to see who's progressing to the next round who they're going to be playing. So it also means that there's a delay in exporting the results uh, to the big screen at the venue and also sharing on social media and live feeds and the website. So a competition management system will automate many of those processes and it would save staff time. And key for me, it would also eliminate the potential for human error. So this in turn would improve the competition experience for everybody. And also the new system would link in with the scoreboards on site, the results, live feeds, and we're going to be producing our own scoring app that would run alongside it. And that would put us back in the forefront of disability sporting competitions. We are hopeful that a new competition management system will be in place for the start of the 2020-21 competition season. It may be that the full version will not be available by then, but the key functionality should be in place. But hopefully, we're hoping for the best on that one. So, Kate, could I have my next slide, please? Thank you. So finally, I'd like to talk to you mentioned in her earlier about our new in fact I think it's our first virtual botcher competition um, which is as you know called the Rainbow Cup and it launched this week on Monday so we chose the name Rainbow Cup because obviously as you know the rainbow has become synonymous with the current coronavirus situation but it's also a, a sign of hope and you'll see that there isn't a pot of gold at the end of our rainbow, but we have botcha balls in our logo. So I think that's quite, quite good, really. So the idea is that absolutely anyone can play botcha. So whether they have botcha balls or whether they use adapted equipment. So it is a form of botcha for all. So it's open for players of all levels, for coaches, for parents, carers, assistants, the workforce, funders, clubs and schools. That's absolutely anyone can take part. And there are nine categories to take part in. And there's even a category for Botcher England staff. And that is even, even now a very hotly contested category. <laughs> so uh, we shared teasers on social media during April. And then the first game was launched this Monday. And when we shared details of the week one game, which is Skittles with a difference. And that was alongside two how-to videos. So one of the how-to videos showed how the game could be played with Botcher equipment. And then the second video showed how it could be played with adapted equipment and as you'll see as weeks go on you can use any any household items to take part in the game so really it's all about engaging with people encouraging them to join in and having a bit of fun really and participants are encouraged to share videos of themselves completing it and sharing it with us and also suggesting new games as we move forward during the weeks so we've already seen some videos from players which is great to see so thank you for those so um, scores from the competition element need to be submitted via a survey monkey link on uh, before the Friday each week. And then I will coordinate the results and we will upload them onto the website on the Friday afternoon. And we even have our announcer, Richard Mann, who will be doing a weekly uh, results video to share details of the leaderboard. So, uh, and although it's planned to be a four week competition, 
the concept the concept is something that we could extend we could adapt it and reintroduce in the close season in future years so i hope you'll all take part spread the word to all your family and friends and encourage people to join in so thank you very much for listening to me i apologize for the um i don't know what the problem was earlier but i'm sorry that you lost me for a minute and i will pass now back to kate thank you Thank you, Sarah. And um, thank you to the rest of the team. Do you want to put your videos on? Thank you, everybody who's listening. And sorry about the technology issues. It has been a bit of a challenge trying to work it remotely with the switching the screens and stuff. So thank you for bearing with us. Well done to the development team in terms of getting through that. Thank you very much. Hopefully it's been useful for everybody. Um, I've put our contact details on the screen. If um, I can see there's been lots of questions coming in. I haven't seen any because I'm posting it. I think, George, I apologise. One of the screens moved on when you were presenting and it was down to me because when I tried to click on the chat, it then moved it on. So we'll get to grips with this if we use this again. But um, So I've not seen the questions, um, but hopefully Danielle's been collating them. But if you haven't asked a question today and there's something that you think of that you want to talk to us about, then our contact details are on the screen. Please get in touch with us. We'd happily chat through um, any questions you've got, but also if there's anything that you're doing on the ground that we could help with, for example, please do get in touch. So it is over to you. Now, ideally we would kind of um, at this stage be able to see you and hear you and all sorts, but I think we've got quite a lot of people, 25 at the moment. Um, so we'll probably, if people are happy um, to go through the chat and pick out the questions from there. Um, Danielle, are you able to read out some of the questions that we've got? Okay, um, firstly, we'd like to thank Stephanie for her comment. Uh, regarding the skills award that's that's lovely to hear thank you for that stephanie um we have a question from neil crowley is there a forum in london oh, I'll tell you this one, um, we don't currently have a forum in london our credit forum to london is based in kent however uh, if, if you've been interested in touch have a forum in and around the london area and this came to drop a message after after the webinar. And I'll be more than happy to support you if doing that. Yeah. Thank you, George. Um we have another question from Neil Sullivan. Um the Lord's Taverners competition was a great competition. I understand they are no longer providing support. Is the competition being run under another name? Um, thank you for your question, Neil. Um, yes, it's the um, Botch England Schools Competition. Um, so the format for the schools competition um, is the, the same format as what was formerly known as the Lord Taverners um, Schools Competition. Thank you, Dan. Um, we have a question from Raphael Young. All classifiable botcher athletes are clinically vulnerable. As defined in the government COVID-19 guidance, a large number will be extremely vulnerable, including athletes with muscular dystrophy, amongst others. Lockdown has not been lifted yet for us, and many will be advised to remain indoors until a vaccine has been developed. Obviously, it's only early days in terms of working things out, but what are Botcher England looking at to protect this group of athletes and avoid disadvantage if competitions are rescheduled before that time? Yeah, if you're happy, I'll answer that one. Um, hi, Raf. Um, yeah, this is something that we're currently talking about. We, um, in some ways, are in a good position in that we will be one of the last sports to get back to usual business um, in the way that we can see what other sports are putting in place and the guidance that comes out. Um, for quite a lot of sports, uh, this week some activities started, like golf and things like that, and they had some guidance that came out and they're trying to work out what that means for them and whether places can reopen. So it will be on a case-by-case um, -case basis, I think, whether they can put standards in place. Um, for us, we've had conversations with Sport England around the fact that if 
um, the government advises that indoor sports, for example, can restart, which I think there's some suggestion that that might be July, that we aren't sort of lumped in with all those sports together and that there's some um, acknowledgement that sports are seen differently so we don't have any challenges if for example we're trying to speak to venues about saying we, we're not actually going to be using the venue we've got booked we need to get money back on that and the government guidance is saying well all indoor activity can go ahead um, we obviously our main priority is the well-being the health and well-being of players volunteers staff everybody involved in the sport and we will be taking advice um, from public health experts as well so we're going to set up a small working group at Botcher England made up of, of staff here but also people that have got expertise and knowledge on that as well as people within Sport England and getting their advice and only at the point where we feel that it's it's safe and we are, we are able to do so will we will make the sport open again. It might be that we can provide guidance um, to clubs activities that can go ahead if they've got people that aren't as vulnerable as others for example um, but obviously it has an impact in terms of the competition so we have talked about looking at at whether we have almost open events for practice purposes that mean that people who have been in lockdown haven't played for a long time aren't going to go straight back into a, a competition anyway and it means that those that might not be able to access the competitions aren't missing out so there's lots of different considerations that we're just at the very early stages of because we, we recognize that our sport will be um, one of the latest ones to kind of lift restrictions um, but it's it's good to get your feelings from it if you've got any strong concerns issues or thoughts on it please do let us know but we're hoping to set up this working group in the next um, few weeks and start those conversations and put some plan in place for that return to botcher some of which will include more virtual online all that sort of stuff um, because we think this could be our situation for quite a while we don't want to not interact with you we don't want to not engage we want to try and make sure we've we've got people that are engaged with botcher so when we do open up you're ready to come back hopefully that answers your question Thank you, Kate. Okay. Um, we have a question from Barry Bowden. When will the outcome from the Botcher Consultants Review be published? Barry, is that, I think this might be referring to the talent plan. Is Danielle? It doesn't say talent plan, it um, says on um, consultant review on the course. I think it must be that, yeah. Um, so at the moment, I think the draft plan is with the board. Um, so once that's gone to the board, there's a board meeting in June. And my understanding is that it's, it's going to that next board meeting. So um, it will be shared after that, dependent on the, the outcome of the board meeting. Thank you, Kate. Um, we have a question from Stephanie Ang. Uh, what are the challenges faced when engaging schools in terms of getting them hooked on botcher for a longer term inclusive sports development? Um, uh, thanks for your question, Stephanie. Um, probably one of the big challenges we face is um, a lot of the, the students that take part in botcher. Um, are transported into and out of school um, so their botcher activity um, at school generally takes part in the, the school day um, and because of the transport requirements um, there's not always an option for um, extracurricular activity either before school um, after school um, and then obviously during, during lunchtime they'll need the, the downtime from their lesson so I think that's one of the, the big, big challenges we face um, is providing the activity outside of the curriculum. Um, but we look to work with schools, each school, on how we can try and support them with, with offering that. So each school is different. Um, and when we work with the school, we'll try and work with a way that works best for them. Can I can I just quickly jump in on there? Thanks, Dan. Um, the I think the location of clubs as well can be a bit of a challenge because we haven't got that many clubs spread across the country. I think for some schools, pupils won't travel too far to clubs if they're on the doorstep great and what we're trying to do is work with those clubs so they can provide that ongoing 
activity there if they haven't got an exit club route to go to within the community so i think that's a bit of the challenge that um as we grow as a sport if we get more clubs it'll probably be easier for schools to link into those um those clubs but also pupils get a whole range of activities to go to and it is it's just trying to get it appealing to them and i think the skills award and some of the stuff that we do through the school games is really appealing so that's part of the battle but we're just trying to retain that um interest in it within school and then if they did go to a club hopefully there's one not that far from them if there is that they're that willing to travel to it at the moment All right, Danielle, you're muted. We missed that, sorry. Thanks, Dan. Um, we've got a question from Bill Head Rapson. He's asking if the webinar will be available to see again, and if so, how? Yes, well, hopefully it's recorded. It looks like it is still recording on here. So um, yeah, you'll get to see all the technology failures again. Um, yeah, all be recorded. Hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll upload it to our YouTube channel and we'll send out all the details about where to find it. If for any reason there's an issue with uploading it and it's going to take a bit longer, we'll email that out to you to let you know when it's available. Thank you, Kate. Um, we've got a question from Dean Wingate. Uh, can Boccia England provide help to people who don't have a club nearby that participate in the Super League and National League to help them find a suitable club to play for? Where did John make it? I kind of in that one. Hmm. Yeah, George, if you can. So, uh, Boccia England have an old club find the Boccia England. I know I'm sorry, but I'm going to have, have a club find there. Uh, if you go on bottling.org.uk and click on club finder, you should be able to find a club nearby. If you can't find a club nearby, drop me an email on the, on the detail uh, on the side before, and I'll be happy to help you find a club that we can be nearby. Thank you, George. We've got a question from Gemma Mitchell. Can we have more information on BC8 competition rules? We have BC8s who need prompting on things like waiting for the referee's indications to throw. This, yeah, I can, I'll take that one. Oh, okay. Sorry, Kate, do you want to? Sarah, you go. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that, yes, it's something I can definitely look to produce. So, is, sorry, am I understanding it right that you want BC8 competition rules produced specifically? Is that the, the nature of the question? Daniel? Yes. So, yes, yeah. Yes, I'll certainly look into that. Not a problem. Yeah, I was just going to say the competition review highlighted that um, there was uh, a need for more sort of guidance and support around competitions. And we, as part of the Botch Boost resources, we're starting to provide a bit more information for people that you can download in, in a small sort of ways. Um, and I think the competition guidance could be part of that as well, so that we can um, have available for people. So what to expect before your first competition, um, an overview of the rules and things like that so that was something that came up in the competition plan and hopefully we'll start to put in place and actually at the moment in lockdown without any competitions to deliver is the perfect time to to get a lot of these resources sort of drafted out brilliant thank you uh, we've got a question from Stuart Sharkey um, regarding do you miss anything at the beginning Stuart the webinar is recorded so it will be posted to our website so you can catch up on on anything you missed at the beginning uh, the other part of Stuart's question is, do you know when the clubs may start training again? At the moment, no. We're reviewing the, um, the guidance and obviously the, the most recent one that came out, all that sort of activity isn't going ahead just yet. It's outdoor sports at the moment that have got a go ahead. However, there's a lot of limitations to that. So even... Um, for sports like there's outdoor swimming is okay but a lot of outdoor swimming places are saying that they're not going to open up because they can't 
um, be sure that the safety is going to be there because they can't provide the lifeguards, they can't, they've got, they can't provide changing facilities. There's a lot of limitations still, even for the sports that can open. Um, so we're, we will be led by the government guidance and what we'll try to do alongside it is produce um, information that relates to botcher, but not just in isolation. We'll be working with public health and um, Sport England and other bodies to make sure that um, it is very clear and we can create as much sort of, um, well, create a standard really to meet. So if you can't meet those standards, it won't be deemed safe to open. So we're, we're just going to keep keep an eye on the guidance, review it on a continuous basis and, and update things on the website if anything changes. We have another question from Stephanie. Are the students who get involved in the skills award being recognised at school for their level of achievement? Um, yes, so um, the fact I have them with me here, um, schools, uh, students taking part in the skills award will all receive their own certificate um, which will be sent out to them once their, their school have returned their booklets um, to, to myself or to the office. Um, and then they're recognised in different ways by the schools. Some schools are just handing them out to the students, some are doing a, um, a presentation at the end of the year. Um, so we're, we're recognising their participation in the Skills Award and then the different schools are recognising it in different ways. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we have a question from Gary. Apologies if I've missed it, but what are your plans for supporting young leaders and coaches in gaining awards and continuing their volunteering and coaching? Is there virtual competitions, CPD, etc.? Hi Gary, I'll take that one if you like. Um, so I mentioned the, the Leaders Award during my presentation. That is the, the primary workshop, I suppose, that we are delivering now to, to young leaders and young officials. So our priority at the minute is to, to get that course um, finalised and created because we're still in the final stages. Um, as well, during this time of year, so now and through the summer, we are traditionally very quiet in terms of delivering awards. So our, our ability to perhaps move that award online isn't necessarily a priority immediately, but if we feel that... Um, coronavirus is going to have an impact on delivery of our training and development in into the future from next season onwards then yes we would perhaps be looking at converting some of these uh, training opportunities CPD into an online format I hope that answers your question thank you Natalie we've got a question from Bill Hedrapson our club is very keen to find a good competition and has attempted to get involved with local schools but they don't seem to be interested. How can we get more involved with them or are these separate groups? Uh, do you want me to say that one? <clears throat> um, so like I said um, in response to Stephanie's question earlier, sometimes schools find it difficult to engage with the activities outside of curriculum time um, so going to local clubs um, might be quite difficult and like Kate said it might be um, that their club or their, their school isn't too close to their club. Um, I think the other consideration when I'm looking at schools and clubs is that the students may live in the other direction to where your club is and where the school is as well so um, the school may be in the middle um, of their home address and, and your club so um, it, it may be that it's not feasible or, or um, logistically viable to get across to you. Um, I guess through clubs, um, George may be able to support me with this as well, that um, clubs, some clubs are more than happy to contact each other um, and try and set up um, activities between them and competition between them um, outside of the, the National League as well. Um, George, have you got anything else you want to, to add? No, I think you covered most of that. 
Can I just add, it might be worth, I don't know if you have already, but contacting your um, local active partnership. So there's an active partnership in every county and it might be worth getting in touch with them to see if there's, I mean, people would usually kind of love the fact that there's somebody willing and able to go in. And if there's any groups that might be interested in setting it up, but also maybe get in touch with us after this um, over email. And it would be good to know where you are in terms of, uh, if, if we're aware of anything on the ground, where there might be some support needed, because where we can encourage more local level activity competition is really great, because then that hopefully leads to people doing it on a more regular basis, which hopefully then leads them to coming into the Heathcote Cup, for example, and staying in the sport longer term. So if we can help with that, please do get in touch with us. Thank you. We'll have another question from Raphael Young. Will a mid-season pre-BE Club Finals updated ranking list be released? I'll take that one, Danielle. Thank you. Um, hi, Raf. Thanks for that. Um, at the moment, a decision hasn't been made on that, but we have uh, currently we're having a monthly review meeting, and that item will be on the agenda for the main meeting. So, uh, and as and when we have a decision from that, that will be uh, published as well. So, we will update the FAQ document accordingly. Thank you, sorry, sorry, I can't give you an exact answer now. <laughs> And that's all we have in so far for the questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Danielle, for reading those oh, out. Thank one you. More time. Oh, another one, more come through. Um, one from Gemma Mitchell. Will there be a skills award available for clubs to run? <laughs> Is that in addition to the, the school skills award, Gemma? Um, something different or the, the same thing? Sorry. Yes, so first for clubs to deliver the skills award at the minute, um, because the programme's funded for um, 12 to 18 year olds in um, education, um, it's, it would be difficult to, to do that just yet, um, but it's something that we may be able to look into um, through myself and George and Kate, um, something in the future that we can potentially offer for, for yeah. clubs as well. It, it's gone down really well. This one, as Dan say, is targeted at schools. Um, what we have talked about uh, internally, early discussions around a possible incentive scheme, because more people want more competitions, and it's going to be difficult for us to put on a lot more with, without a lot more resource. But if there's ways that we could generate at a club level, a way of trying to keep people motivated throughout the year with maybe club level competitions, individual tasks that might be linked, like the Skills Award, with different things that people work towards, might be a virtual competition involvement or something like that so that's that's something that we're looking at as part of the competition plan um and possibly linking with clubs um it could be run through um some coaches we, we early early chat really around it but it's some sort of incentive scheme that people can kind of do at their own pace throughout the year that's separate to um the normal existing competitions that are available i think danielle if we haven't got any more questions we've probably run out of time for questions i'm just conscious of time did we manage to get through them all we did. Um, that is all we've got through. Good. All we've got now. Well, thank you for coordinating that, Danielle. Thank you to everyone sending any questions. If you have got any other questions or when we haven't made things clear and you want to find out a bit more, then please get in touch with us um, and we're happy to help. Um, thank you very much for your time today. I hope it's been useful. Really hope you stay safe and stay well and we will send you information about next September's meeting and let you know where the link is for this one. We're hoping that the next meeting in September will be a bit more of an interactive one and we're going to look at how we could do that virtually. There are different softwares where apparently you can have separate little meeting rooms and things so hopefully it'll be a bit more of a sharing um, webinar rather than kind of us talking to you but hopefully you found it useful. Thank you very much for your time. Stay safe, enjoy the rest of your week and speak to you soon.